Okay, all right. We're going to talk about how to increase global investment into China equity A shares. Is that interesting? All right, okay, cool, cool, cool. All right. Uh, but before we do that, before we do that, um, you know, we, we've been talking multiple references already to Baogao uh, Isijo, okay, or the, the report with 149 recommendations. <laughs> All right. So um, may, maybe we could start with turning to our precious partner, uh, Ji Ren of Fangdao Partners, uh, who helped hold the pen. Uh, you know, chief editor for our capital markets white paper, updating after four years, a humongous task. And we were on call even through this past weekend, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> rushing to get it done. His fellow partner, Blake, almost didn't make the flight because we were doing <laughs> some, some, some last minute uh, edits. Yeah. Um, so, so maybe, uh, Jay, you can start with you. Just talk a little yeah. bit about the, the whole journey of the white paper. Um, yeah, introduce the audience to that. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Asma. Thank you, Linda. Uh, for the opportunity to help with uh, this um, um, white paper. Um, by the way, it, it is really a great piece. Uh, being a great piece, not just being, you know, where hold the pen, but because um, it is really, um, you know, a, a collective wisdom from the market, from the industry. Um, and, um, you know, like Linda mentioned, uh, you know, you won't believe Paul for the past three months, how many sessions, discussions we had with uh, you know various members here, um, and um, you know to to find out what are the very concerns uh, from their day-to-day -day operations, uh, and also you know because of that, um, the you know, at the end uh, we were able to have a very comprehensive um, white paper. Uh, being comprehensive meaning that um, it's, this white paper covers um, everything like the primary market secondary market, fixed income, um, foreign exchange, onshore operation, cross-border data, and, and, you know, and also tax. Um, so which is uh, really can, you know, in addition to its, uh, um, its comprehensiveness, it can also um, work as a sort of guidebook, even Bible, for someone who's new to the market um, to really you know, grab this um, up-to-date um, these um, key issues that this um, industry has um, you know, things uh, worth uh, mentioning. And, and also um, another, uh, another um, good point about this paper is um, being specific. In lawyers like specific. Uh, and being specific, which means that um, we have 149 um, recommendations. Um, you know, from our perspective, we may not expect all those recommendations can immediately, you know, come into, uh, you know, being accepted by regulators. Um, but on the other hand, because this, there's a, a large amount of them, you know, in any case, we believe, you know, they have to accept something, right? <laughs> that's, uh, I think that's number one. Number two, um, even if um, some of them may not be accepted, they will regulators tell us, okay, which aspect about which item that um, you know is not acceptable, then we would know you know what sort of um, revisions we can have, um, and also if the worst case scenario, some of them simply rejected by the regulator. I, I you know personally, I even think that's also a good thing because we will know what is the boundary of what the you know the uh, what the um, regulators have in mind. Then probably that's where we can find certain alternatives to to that particular point. So, um, and I think today that we will discuss uh, some of those uh, very specific specifics. Yes, yeah, thank you very much, G. Yes, in, in fact, you know, these are not 149 new recommendations, right? Uh, a lot of it are issues which we've been having ongoing discussions with the regulators on. And this morning, you may have heard um, SFC uh, Chair Julie Lung uh, even comment on one of them. Uh, at block trading, almost as the fait accompli. Uh, so it's, it's a very, very encouraging that, that this is a moving space. Uh, and uh, yeah, very, very, very happy to, uh, to be part of this process. Uh, the equity section of the white paper uh, spent some time talking about the various investment channels into China A shares, Stock Connect, keep the, keep the traditional QFI channel. I wonder if I could turn to Senen uh, to speak a little bit about these two channels and how you see the evolution of these channels over time. <coughs> Senen? 
Yeah, thank you, Lyndon. Um, you can hear me clearly, right? So um, uh, first of all, um, thank you for the opportunity to uh, present and share the uh, Fidelity's experience <coughs> with, uh, you know, with everybody. Um, I think QFI was, was the very first thing I worked on when I joined Fidelity back in 2007. And at that, at that time, it was the only access program that enabled you know, international investors to invest into the, into the capital markets. Um, and what's interesting is that, uh, with the uh, introduction of Stock Connect, it gave choice to investors. You either select QFI or you select um, Stock Connect. And as they be, these pro programs rolled out, it introduced uh, changes uh, to allow both programs to shift and change to meet the investor demand. So nowadays, uh, before, uh, when you apply for the QFI quota, it used to take months for the license as well as months for the quota application. Uh, nowadays, it's less than 10 days. It's just a registration process, and the quota is no longer e uh, required. Uh, for most of our funds, although Stock Connect is supposed to have a limited universe, for example, it's the SSE 180, uh, 380 innovation index, six billion dollar capital um, market cap, um, and dual listed companies. It, it actually meets 90 percent of our new funds or fund management uh, needs. It's only when you actually want to expand outside of that into more, I guess, different strategies, different instruments. Um, I guess possibly maybe some of the uh, onshore funds. Uh, then QFI is the natural uh, place to go. So I kind of feel that these two programs can complement each other. Uh, Stock Connect uh, provides. Um, a stepping stone into the, the, the market. Uh, as you want to explore, expand, um, I guess, your strategies, then QP is the natural, uh, natural way to go. And um, it will only continue to shape and shift and change and, and uh, help each other uh, improve over time. Uh, if I think about the major asset that Fidelity had when we first looked into China, there was, um, we want to have access, re readily available access to invest in the market anytime. And both uh, QP and Stock Connect uh, provide that. We want to have mobility to be able to repatriate, uh, mobilize um, our, our sale proceeds into other markets. Uh, both programs uh, do that now. Uh, you know, tax clarification, beneficial ownership, all, those are the big heavy hitters initially. And everything now nowadays, I think, is, is kind of like the finer points of, of both programs. And as both programs exist, people always ask me, which program do you prefer? I think the fact that they both are available allows the both programs to change over time to meet the investor demand. Is that, I think that's how I think they'll complement each other. Uh, yeah, th thanks very much, uh, Sen. And it's uh, it should be mentioned that um, you know it's really on the back of Stock Connect, um, you know, the convenience it offers to global investors to invest in China A shares that MSCI finally felt comfortable uh, including uh, China A shares in its Emerging Markets Index series. Uh, they announced it in 2017 and began to include in 2018. Uh, initially, 5% inclusion factor. Uh, then they upped it to 20% the following year. Um, and uh, even though it's, it's uh, and, and, and foreign investors have come in, uh, I think we, we saw foreign investors account for about 5% of the China A share market um, at, at the peak. It's now hovering between 4 and 5%. It's kind of largely uh, stabilized. Uh, and the question is, you know, what does it take to kind of move on to the next chapter? What does it take to go from a 20% inclusion factor the 40%, 50%, uh, even 100%. So that's kind of what we're going to spend the next uh, few minutes uh, talking about. And uh, so MSCI has actually an answered this question for us. Um, you know, they've, they've referenced uh, four primary areas, uh, you know, in order to make it more easy for global investors to invest in the China A share market. Uh, the first is around hedging tools whether that be uh, you know, futures products, listed derivatives, whether that be through securities lending or block trading. You know, as investors like Senate amass sizable positions uh, in China A shares, you know, clearly don't just want to buy and sell. You need the, the ability to be able to hedge your risks uh, accordingly. <clears throat> the second uh, item that MSCI mentioned is around trading holidays. Um, so you know, one of the differences between the two channels through the QFI Direct channel, you have full access every single day that China is open. But unfortunately, through Stock Connect, because you're going through Hong Kong, if it's a Hong Kong holiday or even the day before Hong Kong holiday for the longest time, you couldn't trade uh, China A shares, uh, so there's exposure. Uh, the third MSCI cr uh, criteria was around omnibus trading. So uh, quite a lot of the uh, strategic investors, the, especially the, uh, the passive index funds, uh, they manage uh, hundreds, if not a thousand, uh, underlying funds, and they need to exercise a fiduciary duty and do average pricing across uh, all of their accounts. And so without omnibus trading, it's very difficult for them to do that. Uh, and then finally, um, you know, MSCI commented the very short settlement cycle. For a sale transaction, for example, you need the shares in place on T0, on the trade date uh, itself. 
So how, how, how to achieve uh, that, yeah. Um, so, so, so today, as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna drill down into kind of each of these areas, kind of explore what's been done and what remains to be done. So maybe let's start with hedging tools. So in 2020, CSRC announced some flexibility through the QFI channel, allowing QFI investors to be able to trade uh, in index futures and options uh, in, in China on, on the mainland exchanges, um, on, on, the, on the CFEX, but for hedging purposes only. Um, so maybe I'll turn to Tian first, uh, you know, uh, onshore operating, uh, you know, leading Goldman Sachs onshore. Uh, how, that, how has that been working out? Well, thanks, Linda, for the opportunity. Um, so firstly, I think you know, all the above mentioned hedging tools, uh, whether it's index futures uh, or it's uh, QFI SBL XF, I think you know, these are welcomed by the market and have made successes in that you know, it's, it has helped investors expanding their flexibility and capacity uh, to hedge their positions. Um, I think market, in terms of uh, QFI SBL in particular, I think market are looking for a few um, enhancements. Uh, I think firstly, uh, it's a potential resolution to the uptick long sale rule. Uh, as we know that there are often multiple trading desks or strategies operating within one QFI ID. Uh, so China's long sale uptick rule, you know, uh, essentially restricts other desks trading abilities to sort of long sale if, you know, one of the desks actually have bottle shares. So a potential resolution, you know, as we put out in the white paper, uh, is um, you know like segregation of owned versus uh, versus um, sort of you know borrow shares, uh, which is also a practice in some countries like um, uh, Taiwan uh, and Korea, uh, as far as I know. Uh, so that's one. Uh, and secondly, um, I think the um, you know market is uh, expecting um, access uh, to QV SBL for more types of QFEs. Um, I, you know, both um, loan funds and also hedge funds, um, as that will, you know, help um, improve price discovery, increase liquidity, you know, reduce volatility for the overall market. Um, and lastly, you know, as uh, I think all of you are aware of, you know, there is a recent uh, development, uh, which is the um, OTC derivatives uh, consultation paper. Uh, the background is that over the last couple of years, uh, another alternative hedging tool has become quite popular. So that's the cross-border TRS to access onshore SBL. Um, so latest, uh, the latest consultation paper is actually, has actually in-scoped you know, such product. Um, I think our view is that it's actually a positive development. Um, you know, while it is likely to impose some uh, reporting and disclosure requirements, uh, likely to be ad hoc, uh, but our view is that it's also bringing, bringing in um, clarity um, to sort of the SBL access product in general. And you can also think about, you know, from a uh, leveling um, a playing field perspective, you know, um, if a cross-border TRS access to onshore SBL, you know, is, um, you know, there's more clarity around that. So we expect there will be more clarity around the QV SBL and enhancement to that. Great, thanks very much uh, for that, Tian. It's, uh, it, it is indeed encouraging that uh, regulators and exchanges are increasingly acknowledging the existence of things like synthetic shorts. Uh, it's a reality in the marketplace. Um, but uh, in order to make direct security lending work better uh, in China, you talked about long sell uptick. Um, I, perhaps those in the audience, how, how many of you understand what long sell uptick means? Okay, all right, a couple of our members, excellent. I, I wonder, Tian, if you could kind of explain the concept of an, what, what is an uptick rule within the context of security lending and what are we talking about in terms of a long sale uptick? Right, so <coughs> the uh, uh, long sale uptick rule is, is, is kind of unique to the China capital market in, in, in particular for like QFI, you know, when you, as I said, you have uh, multiple trading decks operating within one ID. So basically you have borrow shares then to long sell the shares, you know, it has to be at price lower than the latest market price. So, you know, that means you have different desks, you know, only one desk has borrow shares, or one strategy has borrow shares, you know, all the other strategies are constrained in terms of selling. Thank you, so, so I guess um, what, what Tian is highlighting is that in, in many markets, most markets, in fact, it's normal to have an uptick rule. <clears throat> what, what is the uptick rule designed for so that when you're borrowing securities and you're short selling the market, there's kind of a circuit breaker, right? So as long as the previous tick was going down, 
then you're forbidden to continue to short the stock. So it won't go continually down. So it's kind of a bit of a circuit breaker. So the last tick needs to go up. It needs to be on an upward trajectory in order for you to be allowed to short sell. So that's perfectly normal. But what's odd, as Tian pointed out in China, is that if you happen to be a broker servicing Q fees and, you know, uh, and, 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 and you, some clients are long investors, other clients are short investors, as long as you have an outstanding borrow, even for your long investor, you can't sell a position for them when the market is going down right. because you're still subject to the uptick rule. So that, it, it, that introduces quite a lot of risk. That's why most Q fees don't participate into the security lending program in China, even though it's been liberalized. So in fact, we were, we were in Beijing talking to regulators and foreign investors account for only 1% of security lending uh, in China. So it's still very, very small. Thank you. How, how about, you know, Brenda's, you know, from Hong Kong, servicing investors uh, through Stock Connect, you know, what, what, do you, what do you see in terms of the, the hedging capabilities for investors through Stock Connect? First of all, uh, for Stock Connect, the stock lending model is bilateral, unlike the QV model, which is, has a central counterparty. Um, and the bilateral model allows the participants to negotiate um, industry agreements, such as the General Standard Master L Lending Agreement. Um, it increases flexibility in terms of counterparties, uh, the collaterals posted, um, and so it's also it adopts a custodian settlement model, um, unlike the onshore one, which adopts the broker settlement model, which foreign investors are more familiar with. Um, so from the source of supplies, we understand there are more activities in stock lending and borrowing under Stock Connect. Um, what can we? How how can we make this tool more effective? I think one thing that the um, uh, participants are asking for is broadening the participation um, of who can enter into the program or who can participate in the program. Um, currently, it's res restricted to um, exchange participants, um, type nine asset managers. So what we would like to see is including um, regulated institutions um, such as agent lenders, um, foreign affiliates of the type nine asset managers, or their lending agents, because we understand a lot of asset managers actually outsource their lending to these agents, and also um, affiliates of the exchange participants. These are uh, the core business of these uh, regulated institutions is mostly in securities lending, so they do know what the international best practice is, so that they can bring it into the program to increase um, more activities in Stock Connect securities lending program. Th thank you very much, uh, Brenda, for that, for that explanation. So even though the Stock Connect program, when it was initially designed and deployed by regulation, securities lending was allowed and consistent with the global framework of a bilateral OTC transaction between two counterparties. In effect, it doesn't work because of the details. And the details, devil's always in the details. The details are that the exchange participants, the definition of exchange participants is too limited. Uh, hence, uh, as Brenda mentioned, you know, our request within the paper one of the 149 recommendations to expand the definition of exchange participants to make securities lending really work within the stock kind of universe. Th thanks very much for that, Brenda. So, so I mean, it, it, it's good to see the intent. It's good to see the intent to open up hedging tools through QFI to have Stock Connect set up with securities lending, but there remain some teething issues the industry continues to work with regulators and the exchanges on. So the second area of MSCI is around holiday trading. Uh, Senna, can you explain, like, from an investor perspective, why holiday trading is such a big issue? Well, I think it's important to be able to trade the market uh, at all times when the market is open. Uh, so I think in the past, for example, um, using a very simple example, Hong Kong has a holiday, but the, uh, the mainland has not a ho have a holiday. You're not able to trade uh, China Asia through the Connect program. And um, you know, markets are active, they're not passive. And so um, you could, there could be market shocks, there could be uh, company specific issue, it could be market volatility. So having that ability to trade as much as pos possible when the market is open is, is very important. Um, so I understand the, the exchange has made some changes in the last uh, little while to enable at least uh, trading um, when at least the um, holiday minus one, which previously was, was impossible, adds to another three trading days to the year. And it'll be interesting to see how that progresses even more because as I said before, uh, markets are active. You, you need to be able to trade at all times uh, because uh, you want to avoid being out of the market, being, uh, being not able to trade when the market's actually open for trading. Yeah, th thanks very much for that explanation, Sanan. So 
as you know, we talked about QFI and the Stock Connect. QFI is seen as the onshore channel. It's no different than if you're investor onshore accessing the market, full universe and full trading across uh, all uh, trading days. But through Stock Connect, the offshore channel, when you run into a Hong Kong holiday, you can't trade. And even bef before, even on a holiday minus one, the day before the holiday, you couldn't trade. But as Senna mentioned, because of the recent reforms, on a holiday minus one basis now, uh, you can trade. So that, that is a, a nice move in the right direction. So I think that checks the box, uh, or heading in the right direction from an MSCI perspective. Yeah, thanks for that, Senna. Um, how about omnibus trading? How about omnibus trading? Um, how do you think that that's working out? And I, I don't know, I, I, didn't, I didn't ask for any speakers to, to comment, but if, if you want, want to comment, you're, you're more than welcome to. How, how's that working out? Okay, yeah. <laughs> all right. I, I threw a curveball at the speakers. You don't have you don't have to speak, unless you want to. <laughs> all right. So so from omnibus trading, um, what's been done so far? What's been done so far is on the Hong Kong exchange side through Stock Connect, uh, they rolled out this thing called Master SPSA. It's a very technical term. Basically, as an investor investing through Stock Connect, for every fund ID, you have an SPSA account. And so um, what Hong Kong Exchange uh, has done is that they've done a one, to ma one master SPSA to many SPSA account mapping to kind of simulate uh, omnibus trading so that an investor can trade at kind of the, the super SPSA or the master SPSA level on behalf of all of the underlying SPSA accounts so that when they get the transactions coming back, they could very easily you know, do average pricing uh, at the underlying fund level uh, at the same price to be fair to the underlying funds. Uh, so that, that's live now. Uh, that's live now and, and it's working. Um, the adoption is relatively limited. Uh, there's still, um, you know, some, some teething issues uh, with, with the master SPSA program. So some um, fund managers with significant resources uh, and, uh, and, and IT budget uh, they're able to make it work, um, but it's still a bit clunky. So we're, we continue to work with the exchange to figure out how to further enhance and optimize master SPSA in order to check the box with respect to omnibus trading. By the way, I appreciate that some of this stuff is quite technical. So um, your questions don't have to be sophisticated. If you want to just you know, ask a, a simple basic question about what does this mean, what does that mean, that, that's totally fine, right? So look at this as kind of you know, part uh, educational, right? Um, <clears throat> so moving on to, to block trading, um, you know, yeah, may, maybe maybe I turn to, back to, to Senate first just to talk about the need for block trading and, and how, how is that working so far um, I, through either channel. Um, I, I would, I'll just talk about the need first, and then I think yep. Tian can probably sure. explain the logistics um, sure. better than I can. I, I think, you know, with block trading, it's point to point, <coughs> isn't it? So there's a large transaction that we want to either buy or sell, and there's a, 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 a counterpart out there in the market, um, you know, it's, it's, it's another tool that we can use to, to trade. And sometimes you take time to build a position, other times it needs to liquidate or buy the position sooner. And um, sometimes there's a cost associated with being out in the market too long. Sometimes you can be patient, but if there's a need to execute as soon as possible, then block trading is a, is a very useful tool that we see in other markets that I understand there's a lot of discussion recently on, on, on facilitating that for under the Stock Connect program, which I think is a, is a good development. We're definitely looking forward to that. Thank you. But before turning to Tian, um, I, I mean, at a phil philosophical level, I know there are some regulators who are a little bit, um, you know, not, not so supportive with respect to, to block trading. Um, you know, they, they worry about is it unfair to retail investors? But I mean, is block trading good or bad for retail investors? What would you say to that, Senator? I think it's just another way of facilita facilitating liquidity. And then I think for most block trading, it's within an acceptable range. There's minimal trade size. You've got to follow certain rules. It's not arbitrary. You can do whatever you want. So as long as you follow the exchange rules, I think it's, um, it doesn't hurt the market. So it's another liquidity channel for, for investors. Thank you. So, so rather than a big trade splash, making a big splash in the market and potentially hurting retail investors unaware of this big splash, a block trade is able to satisfy large institutional investors with, with real need to transact 
but it minimizes that the ripple in the marketplace. So it's actually beneficial for retail investors. So thank, thank you very much for that, Senate. Maybe I turn to Tier now. So how, how is the block trading mechanism work? Does, does it exist? What, what do we need to do uh, to make it happen? Uh, well, firstly, uh, yes, there is a uh, block trade mechanism um, <coughs> in the Asia market. Um, and frankly speaking, it's actually the same for QFI investors as for domestic investors to participate um, into this you know, block trading. Um, you know, there, there, well, there, there are still, I think, uh, improvements to be made uh, for the mechanism. Um, but I think, you know, number one, I think from uh, international investors' perspective, I think you know, they would like to see um, you know, block trading via, via, bond, uh, sorry, via Stock Connect. Um, but, you know, uh, if you speak with regulator about this, I think, you know, one first um, question, one of the first questions from them will be, hey, how about, you know, QFI um, block trading? Because even though QFI are allowed to do block trading, the volume of block trading um, via QFI channel is actually quite small. Uh, you know, obviously we have done a lot, we have facilitated a lot of block trading um, between sort of, you know, domestic and, and international investors. Um, and I will also highlight that there's been some uh, improvements uh, late the last year uh, on the starboard. Um, so the um, uh, one practical uh, difficulty is that you know, there's, all, uh, there's a very limited time window after market close, like half an hour, for the main board and for China Next um, you know, uh, to do crossing matching. However, for starboard, you know, there's an improvement late last year so that now you can do the matching and crossing throughout the trading hours. So I will encourage all of you to actually, you know, think about that facility, think about that feature to use QFI to do block trade. I think, you know, um, if we can show higher volume in the starboard by QFI investors, you know, um, on, on, on block trading, you know, that will help the industry uh, in terms of its advocacy um, to, um, to the regulators. Thank you, Tian. So you've highlighted that, um, you know, the, the level of foreign participation in block trading so far has been rather limited. And you've also highlighted um, that the block trading window right now is actually very limited. It's after trading from 3 to 3.30 p.m. Um, so so is, you know, is, is there a correlation to that? For example, you know, is because it's capped to 3 to 3.30 p.m., are there opportunities to block trade during the trading day that get missed because you're limited to just 3 to 3.30 p.m.? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think the, and also the regulator has, you know, heard what the industry, you know, have, have told them. So that's why, you know, for Starboard, they've improved the system. So now you can do the crossing and matching uh, throughout the trading trading hours. So, um, um, yeah, so I think you know, I'll encourage these people just to use that to show that, you know, this is actually helpful, a very helpful feature uh, from a liquidity management perspective. Great, yeah. thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for that. So there's, uh, th there's some, some promising developments uh, through the QP channel uh, on the starboard, now you can block trade throughout the trading day. So yeah, um, you know, at per, per Tien, try to use it. You have to kind of demonstrate to the regulator that it is useful uh, for them to, to consider uh, expanding it further. And on the Stock Connect side, um, there's, some, there's some activity as well. So we've been uh, having discussions both with Hong Kong SFC, uh, market supervision, as well as with CSRC, market supervision, and it appears that the attitude is quite open. They, they recognize the value of block trading. Uh, we've amassed um, uh, some, um, you know, some arguments, uh, some, some justification for block trading. And we have a meeting, in fact, with the Hong Kong Exchange uh, tomorrow to go through some of these details to try to make block trading also work through, on Stock Connect rather than just on, on the QP channel. Uh, and Julia's remarks uh, this morning were, were quite promising. So, so watch this space. Uh, it looks like we could, we could see some, some good activity here. Okay. All right. Um, and, and now I turn to the last issue of MSCI on the short settlement cycle. I mean, there seems to be a, a mad race to shorten settlement cycle. We see that in the U.S. Um, the announcement from T plus two to T plus one. We saw that in India, uh, successfully accelerating the settlement cycle uh, to T plus one uh, since January of this, this, this past year. Um, but T zero is quite harsh. <laughs> T zero is really quite harsh. Um, and, uh, and, and I wonder, um, you know, uh, you know th there's some Im developments, uh, you know, going on uh, with China Clear. I wonder if Brenda can kind of share uh, some of those developments in the area of DVP. Yep, sure. 
Um, so I'll just give a very high-level summary of the DEP reform um, that CSRC has um, <coughs> completed. Um, basically, at, um, on the trade day at 5 o'clock, um, CSRC, uh, sorry, CSDCC, which is the Central Depository for ACS, they will look at the clearing participants' um, settlement guarantee uh, reserve fund account. And then if it has a um, net receivables position, then the cash and securities will just proceed to clearing and settlement as per normal process. If the clearing participant's account has a net payables, then all the purchase securities of that clearing participant will have a tag which says available for sale, um, but pending settlement process. And then on trade day plus one, when this clearing participant's account is clear, so it has sufficient funds, the tag will be removed and the clearing and settlement continues. This process is probably not that transparent to foreign investors, to QV investors. But we think this is a, a, a great precursor to removing pre-funding. So currently for QV investors, um, they have to have uh, sufficient funds in their account onshore. And then the QV custodian prepares a cash projection report that is sent to uh, all the brokers that the QV has appointed. The broker will only place a buy order when there is sufficient funds in the client's account. And then for some of the QFI custodians who fund their investment in foreign currency, mainly US dollars, um, and they can only execute FX with the QFI custodian. Some QFI custodians don't execute the FX until there is US dollar in the onshore account as well. So all of this adds to the pre-funding or the funding cost of the global investors, which are highly uh, undesirable. So we're hoping that this DVP reform can serve as a um, precursor to removing this pre-funding because there is that tag that um, the, the securities, the purchase securities can't settle anyway unless there is sufficient funds in the clearing participants account. Um, another option we, we would like the regulators to look at is whether the QFI can fund by the end of T-date uh, instead of having funds in the account before they trade or having the QFI custodian extending an intraday credit facility um, just to fund the gap of the, of the time zone difference. Th thank you, Brenda, and, and maybe it, uh, it, it might be worthwhile to just kind of dwell on the technical term DVP, um, realize that maybe not everyone in the audience is familiar with this term. DVP stands for delivery versus payment, right? So on the one hand, you deliver shares. On the other hand, you receive the cash or you deliver cash and you receive the shares, right? That, that it offers security. It offers asset safety uh, for market participants. and. What, what uh, China Clear has done um, is that they've better protected themselves because not only as an investor, if you sell, you part with your security on trade date, but you don't get the cash until T plus one. But you're the CCP in China in the same way. You deliver the security on trade date, but you don't get the cash from the investor on T plus one, so you're exposed. So since the last year, right? So D, the new DVP framework is now in place because of this earmarking uh, process, shares and money exchange at the same time, okay? And so that has brought extra security to China Clear. They're not as exposed as they were before. Uh, so now with DVP in place, as, as Brenda highlighted, uh, maybe we could offer this benefit, share this benefit also in, with investors because investors still need to pre-fund. So they still need to have the money in place on trade date uh, but not get the shares uh, until later. Yep. Thank, thank you, Brenda. All right, um, I, I noticed we're, we're getting close uh, to the end, um, and, uh, but I, I wanted to, to you know, turn to my panelists and ask, you know, you know, maybe, maybe you can highlight some of your favorites within the 149, but what, what, what are some of the, the market structure enhancements that you think global investors would like to see? Um, maybe since Brenda just spoke, maybe I'll turn to Senin. <coughs> Yeah, thank you, and I'll be, I'll be quick on this one. I, I think the, um, the biggest ask for Phil at this point is, um, uh, I think for China, cross China uh, initiatives, the biggest undertaking we're doing right now is to build up our domestic business, our fund management company in China. Uh, we would want to make the most use and leverage the infrastructure onshore, the, the on-the-ground uh, investment expertise onshore to manage onshore funds as well as provide advice to offshore investors, offshore Q fees. And to the extent that we can provide this or with the clarification of regulations, um, which I understand is forthcoming later this year, um, this, this could, would be perfect and, and, and allow us to make the most use of our, our onshore presence. Uh, we understand that a lot, lot of these regulations aren't yet clarified yet until uh, maybe end of the year. 
And in fact, there's a, there's a paper that Asysma is preparing to, to uh, in response to the consultation uh, request by the regulators. So we're hoping to finalize that and have that clarified by end of the year so that we can make more use of our onshore presence. Great. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much, Sen and Tian. Yeah. Uh, well, I think uh, I'm going to mention um, data cross-border sharing. I think that's maybe our next project um, for the industry across sell side and buy side, um, you know, given the complex um, and also it's very new uh, regulations in China. You know, there's for the security industry, but also for uh, personal information, you know, PIPL, similar to the European, you know, PIPL. Um, so our onshore entity, you know, we are one of the first, like foreign brokers to go through the process, uh, but there are still a lot of pending issues, in particular in, ter in terms of, for example, you know, resource sharing. I'm sure, you know, Senate can also tell the story about resource sharing. Um, and, uh, you know, what about your employees, you know, personal information? What about clients, you know, contact number, all the information, how do you handle with that? Uh, at the same time, utilize the, uh, you know, advanced system and technologies, you know, um, offshore. Yeah, um, so, you know, I think that's something, you know, for all of us and for the floor here, you know, for all of uh, you guys to think about and speak with regulators. Yeah, th thank you, Tian. And th this is uh, clearly an issue that all of our members, especially with onshore platforms, uh, they, they really struggle with in terms of how to share data with their affiliates offshore. This is an issue that we've also been having active dialogue with the regulators on to completely get it, to completely understand. S but sometimes it's kind of a bit outside of their authority, they need to negotiate with, with CAC. So yeah. this is underway, uh, and NFRA, uh, who is here in the morning, uh, they're also helping to shepherd this process. So it, it's, it's underway, it's it, it will just, yeah. just take time. Uh, thank, thank you, Tian. Brenda, from you. Yeah, so my colleague Shan earlier on in the panel also mentioned about consistency <coughs> across the different investment schemes. So if we look at both the onshore and offshore, offshore schemes into China, like Stock Connect, Bond Connect, CIBM Direct, um, QV currently is the investment scheme that um, doesn't allow the QV investor to execute FX or spot FX with any counterparty except the QV custodian. Mm -hmm. um, so if you look at QV, if you remit funds from offshore, you can do, obviously CNH is freely tradable. You can also um, execute FX under PBOC 159. So you can also execute with um, a wide range of counterparties. CIBM Direct that has been relaxed, um, unlimited number of counterparties onshore. Um, obviously, Bond Connect has also <coughs> been relaxed um, to three at the moment. Um, hopefully, there will be more. So QFI, so uh, QFI is the only scheme where um, the QFI investors can only execute FX with the QFI custodian. So this is what we are lobbying for um, as one of the items that we hope that that will be relaxed as well to enable best execution, which is what all investors are looking for. Um, in terms of the uh, remittance and repatriation, they all go through their QFI's onshore account in China. So that can still, the QFI custodian can still monitor the inflows and outflows to make sure they comply with the regulations. Um, so I just want to highlight that uh, relaxing the counterparties will still maintain control um, for, uh, for some of the items that I think the regulators is a bit concerned about, but um, I just want to address that. It wouldn't change that. Great, thank you very much, Br Brenda. Um, I'd like to close with GE. Uh, so you deal a lot with regulators in China. You've helped a lot of market participants, um, you know, navigate the regulatory landscape. W what's on the mind of the regulator from your vantage point? Yeah, I I think it's uh, you know we deal with the regulators from time to time, and one way or another, especially when we have a ask. Um, I think it's um, among other things to um, to um, there are probably two things we, uh, I want to highlight. Uh, number one. You need to understand their policy, their policy concerns. Uh, number two, it is important for what you said, and also probably much important for how you said it. Um, the reason for that is just to take an example. Um, like um, you know, we um, there's a lot of uh, um, discussion over China Connect, Stock Connect, and QFIs. And ideally, we you know we want everything that QFI has can be also available to Stock Connect because naturally it's easier to access through Stock Connect. Um, but of course, you, that's from the, you know, you know, our perspective, market perspective. But if you look at things from the regulator's you know, um, point of view, probably what they want is um, there's two, the provide, regulators provide two channels for the investors to access. Um, ideally, they probably want investors to have access to both of them. 
um, if um, um, if um, most of the if the mechanism makes most of um, investors only go to one of them, probably uh, that's not something they want to see. So in in that sense, um, which comes at um, you know how you understand their policy concern. That's number one. Number two, um, even you know with their um, policy concern in mind, and also which means that there's no way for us to improve one of the, um, for example, like the um, mechanisms and existing infrastructure of, of the stock connect, which is definitely not, which actually we have been doing that. And you know, how we did that? Because um, you know, instead of simply ask, you know, like a blanket request, please make everything available to QC, you know, the same as, um, you know, uh, sorry, everything, uh, um, you know, Available to Stock Connect, the same as QC. You know, rather than asking that you know blanket ask that simple question, we make it again you know specific and piece by piece, piece and pieces. Uh, would it be possible to extend trading days? Would it be possible to do the block trading step by step, one by one? And also at the end of the day, what you may have probably will have the roughly almost the same result. So, so I think perhaps uh, you know we, um, from the FI and also the asset managers by side perspective, that's something that we can you know always consider when we have a particular ask to approach the regulators. Thank you, G. So don't don't make a blanket ask like level the playing field between QFI and Stock Connect. Be specific, mm -hmm. and that's why we have 149 recommendations <laughs> in the China Capital Markets. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, to our distinguished panelists. Um, yep. Uh, thank, thank you all for your attentive uh, focus to our panel. Thank you. Thank you.